as, as occurs in the United States between providers and parents. And I call this typical because um, it's representative of what we've been seeing um, as part of a research study I've been conducting over the last few years where we go to where these discussions are happening, primary care offices, um, during health supervision visits and videotape them. So this is an actual vaccine discussion. I like starting with this for two reasons. It helps us keep things in perspective, but it also does a really good job, I think, of illustrating the many challenges and opportunities that await us as we try to think about how do we improve parental acceptance and improve childhood vaccine uptake. So it goes like this, provider. <clears throat> so we missed his one-year-old vaccines. Do you want to do those today? Parent. I'm really on the fence right now with vaccinations. I have a lot of friends, mothers who get things all the time about vaccinations, how they don't vaccinate. And I don't know, I really haven't researched it enough on my own to feel confident in saying I'm not going to do it. But I don't know, I'm mixed about it. Um, I certainly don't want you to do the vaccines if you wanna read more about them and we can give you information. If, are there questions I can answer for you about them? I certainly can give you my opinion. So what does he do for? The MMR, chickenpox, and hepatitis A. He's almost 15 months, though, so there's boosters also of vaccines that he's already gotten that he would be due for. Mm-hmm. So I'll just tell you from my experience, so we have a slightly higher rate of vaccine refusal in our state. I've already diagnosed about, it's been about two cases of whooping cough in the last three weeks. Mm-hmm. So he is partially vaccinated. He's had three rounds of the whooping cough vaccine. He's at a little higher risk for having you know, complications of that just because he's got smaller airways and smaller lungs. So that would be certainly one I would consider doing seeing that he's had that before. Mm-hmm. He could also get Hib. What's that for? So that's the one he's also had three doses of before. It's for a bacteria that causes pretty serious infections in children like blood infections, meningitis, I actually don't see a lot of these compared to whooping cough. Mm-hmm. I, I can totally respect wanting to space out. Um, so, but um, why don't we do the whooping cough? I feel okay about that one. The other ones, I don't know. Are those something we really need to do? You get an idea of the challenges that await us by simply this brief snippet of a vaccine discussion. For instance, how do we clinicians, providers, public health nurses, communicate our recommendations for a vaccine for a child at a uh, visit and pursue that recommendation in the face of parent resistance on the one hand, but on the other hand, ultimately respect parent decision-making authority. There's not a lot of advice or evidence to help clinicians in this regard, and it's been a focus of my research to try and address that gap and part of what I want to talk with you today. So two components of my talk include identifying and understanding vaccine has in parents, and I'll mainly do that by discussing validation and refinement of the parent attitudes about childhood vaccine survey, a tool I developed. And I'll end with talking with vaccine has in parents, expound a little bit more on this observational work I've done and early evidence for effective communication strategies with um, parents. So the parent attitudes about childhood vaccines or PACV survey <clears throat> is a tool I set out to develop about five, year, five years ago really to explicitly identify vaccine-hesitant parents, have a valid and reliable way of identifying this target population of interest, really so I could enroll them in research studies, understand more about how to improve our communication with them, and ultimately to design interventions to improve their acceptance of childhood vaccines. I won't spend a lot of time going into the development and initial validation of the survey. I've published this um, and in those 2011 articles down below, um, if you uh, want to go read more about them, please do so there. I'm happy to expound on that later. I will say that um, we used a standard iterative qualitative approach to develop um, the PAC fee, and then we pre-tested it with parents to assess face validity and item understandability, and then we also gave it to a cohort of parents um, to assess this construct validity. Was it measuring this underlying construct of vaccine hesitancy as we intended it to? After those uh, initial development and validation um, studies, we ended up with the PACV, which was 15 items um, under three domains, took less than five minutes to complete and read at a sixth grade level. And you can see the three domains listed there, the number of items under each domain, and an example item under each domain that we asked parents to complete. Now the PACV is scored, we assess a numeric score for each item, zero for the non-hesitant response, one for the equivocal response, usually not sure to an attitudinal question, and then um, two to the hesitant response. Then we simply 
add up each item numeric score to get a total raw score, and then we convert it to a 0 to 100 scale, with 100 being a very highly hesitant parent. What we intended to do next was to try to understand the predictive validity of the PACV, and we sought to determine that really to see if um, the PACV had the ability to identify a parent early on in the childhood immunization series, um, such that they were hesitant enough that they would go on to underimmunize their child. And if we had a tool that had predictive validity, it would give credibility to the PACV being used as a screening tool, provide a window of opportunity for clinicians, researchers to intervene. Um, since vaccines are administered over time, potentially positively influence a parent's immunization behavior. So what we did is we gave it to a separate cohort of parents when their child was two months, and then waited till their child turned 19 months, and then accessed the child's immunization record and associated that, um, the child's immunization status, with the parent's PACV scores at two months. And this is what we found, and I published this late last year in JAMA Pediatrics. If um, PACV score is there on the x-axis, um, 0 to 100, but I've separated it out into 10 score tiers really for illustrative purposes, and then on the y-axis, to the child's immunization status expressed as percent days under immunized, a really sensitive measure to not only account for missed doses but delay in getting recommended doses. You can see that with increasing parental PACV score suggesting higher hesitancy, you get higher under immunization of their child, suggesting that in our sample that there was predictability for the PACV. And interesting, this association between PACV score and under immunization really didn't become statistically significant until this threshold score of 50 or higher on the PACV, meaning it wasn't until the parent had enough hesitancy by scoring high enough on several items on the PACV did they actually act on that belief and significantly under immunize their child. And so that's the score threshold we use to determine whether a parent is hesitant or not when taking the PACV. Well, that, I want to emphasize that was really just a start to our evaluation of the PACV. And since then, I've been working to refine the PACV. <clears throat> and I've been working with uh, Dan Kahan at Yale, who has uh, uh, expertise uh, in advanced psychometric methods to do this. And our um, two goals for the refinement of the PACV uh, are this. Our overarching goal was to reduce the number of items from 15 uh, to a lower set of items, really for the obvious rationale of minimizing parental burden and completing the PACV, as well as increase the potential for providers adopting it as a screening tool in the clinical setting. And to achieve that overarching goal, we sought a secondary goal, which was to enhance the measurement precision and predictive power of the PACV. And we used uh, several psychometric methods to do this, and here are three examples. As I mentioned, we, in my original analysis, we collapsed responses into three tiers, but using uncollapsed responses and multiple factor analysis can increase the precision of the PACV. And we did that. We, could, we also explored using alternative regression models to associate PACV uh, immunization status, and, or sorry, child's immunization status and PACV scores. In my original analysis, I used linear regression. And then, probably most saliently, we used item response theory modeling because of its ability to potentially discriminate parents who have high enough hesitancy to yield hesitant behavior more so than the way we, I scored the PACV originally using simple sum, which essentially assumes that in each um, um, item, the increments between responses to that item contribute equally to the measurement of the underlying construct. Well, that assumption might not be true, and item response theory modeling can account for that by weighting the responses. So after doing um, this uh, secondary analysis, Dan and I found five items that performed equally as well as the uh, full 15-item scale, and I show you the five items there to give you an idea of how well it performs. These are sensitivity, specificity, decision plots. And just by looking at them, you can see that they're similar, but focusing in on the crossover points, which illustrate the cutoff point in the scale where the sensitivity and specificity are optimized, they occur essentially at the same cutoff point and at the same threshold of sensitivity and specificity. So what steps are needed to advance the clinical use of the PACV? Well, I'd argue there's at least three beginning with additional scale development, very much like the work, additional work Dan and I are doing to validate um, short scales. And we're uh, currently pursuing um, using that short scale in an independent data set to determine if it uh, performs equally as well. But probably more importantly, we need additional predictive validity studies in different geographic populations, um, both in the US as well as elsewhere, in particular developing countries, as well as in different age populations. The PACV was designed to identify 
parents hesitant towards the childhood primary immunization series, but could it be modified for an adolescent context or even in the prenatal setting? And I give you examples of US-based researchers that I've been collaborating with to do just that, but we need more. And then finally, I think investigating the relationship between the ability of the PACB to identify parents um, who are, um, uh, can, can predict uh, parents who are hesitant towards specific vaccines, for instance, can identify parents hesitant towards MMR better than those hesitant towards DTaP. And concurrently, I think now that we have some preliminary data, at least on the preliminary or the predictive validity of the PACV in one population, we ought to pursue determining the feasibility of screening parents using it as a screening tool before our health supervision visits, mm -hmm. communicating that score and the um, specific item responses to that child's provider before that visit, and determine whether that alone can impact the child's immunization status. And then once we accumulate evidence, assuming we do, figuring out how to integrate that into clinical setting. As many of you know, just because there's evidence for something doesn't mean providers begin to use it. So in the last five minutes or so, let me end with talking with vaccine hesitant parents and, and communicating some of the results from my observational work. So as I mentioned, we uh, conducted um, over 100 um, videotaped, or we videotaped over 100 encounters um, among primary care providers in the Pacific Northwest, particularly Washington State. It was a cross-sectional sample. Uh, we included in our sample well child visits or health supervision visits of kids from one to 19 months, really for the explicit purpose of trying to understand how this vaccine discussion currently occurs, how it unfolds. Before we can get to what ought to be better and how can we improve it, we needed to understand how um, providers and parents were uh, currently discussing vaccines. So when we um, limited our analysis to those encounters where the provider um, initiated the vaccine discussion, since that was the majority, we asked ourselves, well, how does the provider do this? And in our sample, interestingly, we found really one of two ways providers did this. The first way is what we called a presumptive initiation format, where the provider simply assumes that the parent is going to go along with what the providers were recommending from a vaccine standpoint. It's time to start all those vaccines. We're gonna be doing the MMR and chickenpox, period. Move on. Three quarters of providers use that format. The other quarter sort of was on the other end of the communication um, continuum and used what we call the participatory format. Very much increased the decision-making latitude uh, with parents regarding this vaccine decision, saying things like, how do you feel about vaccination? What do you wanna do about vaccines today? A quarter of providers used that format. That was interesting, but what came next? How does the parent respond to the provider's initiation? And we stratified this by provider in, uh, uh, initiation type. So when a provider used a presumptive format, we found that 74% of parents accepted that recommendation outright to move on the conversation, though 26% verbally resisted in some way, either explicitly saying, no, I don't want to do that, or less explicitly citing a contingency, well, my husband's not here, or some other um, concern. However, we saw the exact opposite when a provider used a participatory format. 83% of parents voiced some resistance, only 4% accepted. And by the way, when we looked at subgroups, vaccine-hesitant parents as measured by the PACV, this was a similar result. You can imagine this was statistically significant, both at the bivariate analyses level and after adjusting for parent, child, and visit characteristics, including the parent's hesitancy status. There was a 17 and a half fold increased odds that a parent would voice some resistance if their provider used a participatory initiation format rather than a presumptive. So that was interesting. We published that late last year in pediatrics, but that was really only half the story, or half the encounter. We still had some open questions that we sought to answer, and we conducted um, additional analyses that we just completed. I'd like to share the results of that. For instance, we focused on this intermediary outcome of parent verbal resistance, but was that synonymous with what happened by the end of the visit? If a parent verbally resisted, did that mean that they refused at least one or more vaccines by the end of the visit? We don't know. We showed that there was an association between initiation format and verbal resistance, but did this association hold true also for vaccine behavior at the end of the visit? We don't know. And if there is an association, how much of it was mediated by whether a parent voiced resistance or not in the discussion, 
or were there some other variables that were important to mediating this um, association? For instance, a, a variable we saw in our initial analysis, the provider pursuit of vaccine recommendation. We saw when parents voiced resistance, about half the time providers gave additional reasons to the parent why they ought to reconsider. Maybe this was a more important mediator of an association between initiation format and vaccination behavior. Well, this is what we found. Parent verbal resistance was not synonymous with parent vaccination behavior. In fact, 30% of parents who voiced initial resistance ended up accepting all vaccines at the end of the visit. And about a quarter of these, <clears throat> or a quarter of vaccine has in parents did so as well. There was a statistically significant association that remained between initiation format and vaccination behavior. In fact, if a provider used a participatory format, significantly decreased odds that a parent would accept all vaccines by the end of the visit after accounting for parent, child, and visit characteristics. Turns out that parent verbal resistance did mediate a proportion of this um, association when we pursued a causal mediation analysis, but the stronger mediator was whether a provider pursued the vaccine recommendation. We found, in fact, that pursuing the vaccine recommendation after initiating in a participatory way sort of uh, tempered the negative association between participatory association and reduced vaccination behavior. So I want to end with this paradox of taking a participatory approach. You might start wondering, why are we asking parents what they want to do about vaccines? And then, cause since I just told you that not only it increased verbal resistance during the discussion, but decreased odds that a parent ends up accepting all vaccines at the end of the visit. Well, one might argue, and my colleague Julie Leask so um, eloquently did in response to my pediatrics article, there are other variables here of interest. For instance, how does a parent feel about their visit after um, they have these vaccine discussions with parents. As you all know, parent satisfaction is becoming an important um, outcome measured in the clinical arena. So we asked parents this after each videotape visit. We gave them 15 items to rate their physician on regarding their interpersonal communication generally, regarding their vaccine communication, regarding their care received overall. And it turns out when a provider used a participatory approach, significantly increased odds that a parent rated their visit experience highly than if their provider used a presumptive approach to initiate the vaccine discussion. So we saw this inverse association, at least from how the doctor initiated the vaccine discussion, between these two um, important outcomes, parent vaccine acceptance and parent satisfaction. Of course, we saw the reverse with the presumptive. Increased odds the parent accepted, but decreased odds they really felt good about that visit. So one might wonder, are these mutually exclusive outcomes? As a practicing general pediatrician, they often feel that way, I'll tell you that. But I, would, I hesitate to say that we can't achieve both, and I would argue we should strive to achieve both. And when, uh, I'll give some examples in my conclusion slide here of how we can potentially do that. First, let me say that the PAC fee is available for use um, by all of you, and some of you are, have already asked me to um, send it to you. There's my email. Please email me. I'm happy to send you an electronic copy. I have paper copies here. Perhaps I should put it on the cloud for all of you to look at as well. From a communication standpoint, this is preliminary data, so I don't want um, to overemphasize, or I want to emphasize that um, there's a lot of work yet to be done. It wasn't a longitudinal study, uh, as we remarked in the last um, talk, that, and simply cross-sectional, so there are a a number of limitations to this work, but it, these are my preliminary conclusions from that um, study. First is don't be afraid to be presumptive when discussing vaccines with parents. At least in the U.S. still, in many other countries, this constitutes the majority of parents. And especially when it's your first time talking with parents about vaccines, I think it's okay to be presumptive and assume that they're one of the majority. John is going to get three recommended vaccines today, or even a little bit gentler approach, she's due for shots today, is that all right? That in fact is a potential communication strategy um, that can achieve both high satisfaction as well as parent vaccine acceptance. Adding that sort of tagline, is that all right or is that okay, increases the perception among parents that they have more decision-making latitude, but it's presumptive enough, a nudge enough, sort of a default option, this is what we're doing, that they often don't voice a disagreement and get um, their child immunized as a result and feel good about that decision. And then um, if you're going to take a participatory approach, pursue vaccines when parents resist. This is the other strategy we saw in our data set where providers achieve both. 
starting with a participatory very much approach, very much improved satisfaction. But these providers then committed to giving additional reasons to parents when they did voice resistance about why they ought to reconsider. So I encourage providers to have a set of um, uh, phrases or arguments for why parents ought to re reconsider. And these were two examples we saw frequently in our data. I'd like to acknowledge all of my collaborators and happy to take questions. <laughs>